So welcome back to another season of Good Morning Metro South. I'm Chris Cooney. I hope you had a wonderful summer. Uh, this is our first uh, Good Morning Metro South of the new season. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, at Thorny Lee Golf Club. You know, this is one of four golf clubs in the city of Brockton. It's very unusual uh, in this state to have a gateway city with four golf courses. And uh, of course, we like to say uh, this is a very nice one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they all are, are pretty extraordinary, but uh, this one has the meeting space and we're happy to be here. We actually hope to return here uh, periodically throughout the coming year and uh, kind of make it our, uh, our new kind of go-to home when we're not on the road holding these at Stonehill or Bridgewater State and, and other places um, throughout the region. Uh, in fact, the last time I spoke at this podium uh, was with the former uh, mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter. And uh, we were here celebrating uh, public servants. Can we just turn the microphone just down a little bit? Okay, I can do that again. So we were, now let's wait on. How's that, better? So we were here celebrating uh, public service uh, in Brockton and uh, honoring um, police, fire, and, and public servants uh, as the Rotary Club does every year. And uh, in his honor, I'd like to start today with a moment of silence in memory of uh, Bill Carpenter. Thank you very much. Uh, we know he would have been here. Today's the day after the primary. Uh, we want to congratulate all of those candidates who made it through the primary, including uh, our mayor, Moses Rodriguez, who's here with us. Moses. So um, we're pleased to have with us um, uh, some great speakers today. And you're going to hear about the census, which, which is very important to the city and the surrounding area, but also um, chief economist for uh, Eastern Bank. And uh, in order to guide us through today's program, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sue Joss. She's the president and CEO of the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center and former uh, chair of the Chambers Board. Sue. Thanks, Chris, and um, welcome everybody. It's great to be back at the chamber after a little bit of a hiatus, and um, I'm especially, especially excited to be back with um, our friend from the Census Bureau here today. Um, so I'm celebrating my 20, 25 years at the Health Center and in Brockton, and um, I always thought I was the outsider in Brockton. Um, had when I took this job, had never been to Brockton and had never lived in Massachusetts, and as far as I knew, neither had any of my family. Um, so my husband's been looking at census data and tracking our family tree. So it turns out um, that I have relatives all over Brockton from about 1900 through the 1940s. Um, we had six different addresses in Brockton of um, members of my family. And then right up until um, almost 1990, um, a lady who was my co distant cousin um, lived right across the street from where the Vicente's um, branch of our health center is now. So you just never know. Um, so this, that was all census data. So thank you for that. Um, so I, I, I'd like to welcome everybody and um, first start with, um, sorry. First start with um, thanking our ambassadors. So um, as I call their names off, if you could stand and then hold your applause for the end. Um, Rachel McNeil, Bridgewater Savings Bank. Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union. Susan Cuniff, Mansfield Bank. Catherine Light, Envision Bank. And Paul Key, Massachusetts Community College. So thank you for our ambassador team. So we have a number of town officials here or scheduled to be here today. So I know that a couple are not here yet, but I'm going to read all the names anyway. Um, and again, if you wouldn't mind standing as you call your, as I call your name and we'll recognize you at the end. From the town of Whitman, Frank Linen. Town of Whitman, Lisa Green. City of Brockton, Mayor Moses Rodriguez. City of Brockton, Ann Beauregard. State Representative Claire Cronin, and State Senator Michael Brady. So thank you all for coming. How about a round of applause? Awesome. 
Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. At this time, I'd like to introduce uh, um, and thank today's spot sponsor, Hub Technical Services. Hub Tech Services partners with the best-in-class technology vendors to provide cost-effective end-to-end IT solutions for their clients. Services include managed service help desks, security and business continuity solutions, data center and cloud transformation, network support design, and client computing and mobility. HubTech is a full-service IT solution provider headquartered in Southeastern and servicing clients throughout New England for over 25 years. Their mission is simple, to, make, to take ownership for all that they do, to protect those who trust them, and to make lifelong clients from every customer contact. They are a proud member of the Metro South Chamber, and Hub Tech has been a member since 2001. Please welcome Hub Technical Services President, Joseph Lovateri, who will be interviewed by our own Dan Trout from Northeastern Savings Bank. Thanks, Sue. I think uh, we're going to get a haircut first. All right, we're going to get a haircut for these cheers. Uh, Joe, thanks for sponsoring. Uh, I know you've been, uh, uh, I didn't know it went back to 2001, so that's great. I'm a chamber, chamber member. Uh, Joe, what's the biggest IT challenge that organizations, businesses, we have a lot of businesses here today, uh, what do they face? What's the biggest IT challenge? So, it doesn't matter whether it's a small company, a private organization, a school, or a business, or a city or a town. The number one threat today is sec security and maintaining security. Um, it's uh, cybersecurity is something that you read about every single day. Uh, there's another new threat, and some years ago it was the big ones that we would hear about. You know, whether it was a Home Depot, a Target, uh, and you know, or Equifax, so it was one of the most recent ones. But every organization is facing this as a challenge. Uh, one of the second challenges that they're facing is IT staffing. If they have an IT staff, it's very difficult to keep that IT staff. If they do have an IT staff that doesn't want to stay, it's hard to keep them current. And that's why you hear about managed services. It's a big part of our business. We take that responsibility and manage it for you so that you don't have to worry about staffing. And um, the, um, the third one uh, would basically be the cloud strategy that you may or may not have. Uh, everybody is moving to the cloud to some, in some regard. In some cases you see it, in some cases you don't see it. As an organization or a business, if you don't have a strategy, you need one. Um, in some cases we're being forced to move to the cloud. Some of you have seen it maybe with your Office 365 um, moving, uh, your mail moving. Um, so, uh, different types of uh, applications that you use, uh, you, this is going to become prevalent. And one of the things that's driving it, of course, is recurring revenue. They want to be able to um, have a subscription service where they're getting paid all the time and not just sell one license. So having a good strategy is going to be vital to the growth and vitality of any business or organization. If you don't have one, we can provide that. And organizations like ours can provide that and walk you through and assist it. If you have one, it's good to get a second set of eyes on it and see if it can be validated and make sense for your operation. Great, thanks. One of the three issues you just mentioned was uh, security. So we hear all the time about uh, the breaches that are happening, uh, usually the large ones, sometimes we don't hear about the smaller ones. So uh, where and how should a company start to strengthen their own IT security? So there are a, a few different areas that you can focus on. One of them is, do you actually have a strategy? If you're a business owner, if you're a director of an organization, uh, do you have a written information security policy? If you don't, you need one. And compliance is coming. So it's better to get out in front of this issue and start putting one together. And some of that is something as simple incorporating uh, password policies, and how you handle technology, how you provision technology, but it's a lot more extensive than that. It isn't simply about finding one on the internet and saying that you have one. Uh, there is information and knowledge that has to be transferred to your employees to make it effective. So that's one area that you can focus on. 
Another area you can focus on is backup and restore. Most organizations and most everybody knows that have dealt with computers, you got to have a backup. And some people think of it as maybe a thumb drive or an external hard drive. Um, obviously, in an organization, it's a lot more extensive than that. Most companies and organizations that we deal with today, they have backup policies. They're doing regular backups. Some of them on premise, some of them out to the cloud. The real challenging question is have they ever tried to restore? Because in the event of a serious breach, your ability to restore is the difference between being in business and not being in business. So having that policy and having an opportunity to test it and ensure that it is valid for your organization is, is critical. One of the next things that you can do, to, if you, if you, um, you know, want to keep things simple, you can hire an organization that can do an assessment, that can come in, it's an outside set of eyes. You may have IT staff that have conducted assessments or they believe that they've conducted security reviews and presented maybe the CEO or the CIO or the CFO with a, with a document that says that, you know, we're okay, here's what we did to verify it. An outside set of eyes is one of the best things that you can do and one of the best inv investments that you can make. If you're doing everything great, that's wonderful. It validates it. And you have confirmation for the purpose of compliance to show that you've taken that step. If you haven't done that, then that would be one step that you could take. Another thing that you could do is to simply hire a company like ours that offers automated managed service services that can address security, oversight, help desk, and just the, the operational functionality of your servers, network, and storage. Uh, that's all something that we can do today with the technology remotely. What we do is we have our own secret sauce and our ability to combine all of the best pro products in the business to be able to make sure that you are protected as best as you can be. The cool thing about this is if you engage us today, we could incorporate and turn things on tomorrow and you could immediately improve your security posture. That's not true of every company, but it is true of our organization. Uh, the fourth thing that you can do is to um, ensure that you've, you're having a policy review. Uh, every, the way that you get resources in an organization, whether it's email or whether it's uh, through the business applications that you're using, usually goes through an IT manager. And those policies tend not to get updated. So having a policy review as part of a security assessment is something that could be very effective in minimizing the impact. Another area would be cybersecurity awareness training. This is a program where, uh, unfortunately, everyone in this room probably has clicked on a file or a link that then they said, oh my god, what is that? Where is it going? Where is it taking me? In a little bit of a panic because that is how the majority of breaches occur. It used to be that somebody would be outside the building trying to hack with a laptop. Now they don't have to. They can get people to click on a link, click on a file, and basically they're unlocking the keys to the kingdom. They're basically taking and, and unloading a set of code that will go off and give them or capture uh, the passwords they need to do some real damage. Um, and the, if you do not have a training program in place that would train your staff members, um, you're, you're missing the opportunity to improve your security posture. And again, we have the ability to consult in this area and then also provide an automated platform that can carry this training out for you. Um, this past weekend, I got one. I think a couple of uh, people in my organization got one. And it was something as simple as, um, it said from HR, and it said this is the updated handbook that we've been working on, please take a look at it. And it was a link to click. And it looked like a file. I didn't click it, of course, but it turned out to be a test that my own team runs to try to make sure that our people always stay aware of the different ways that they're going to be enticed to click on something. I just have to call my office about that uh, updated handbook. <laughs> Joe, those are great solutions to some of the difficult problems with IT. One of the things you see, because IT companies can be service remote, 
how does a company go about picking an IT vendor? It's a great question, Dan. I mean, ultimately, you're not looking for the college kid that just got out of school and he is known to be a hacker and a gamer and whatever, or it's the smartest one in your family. It's not the person that you want doing that. Uh, you want to choose a company that's been in business for uh, quite a while, that has an established practice, that can give you real references uh, and show you, um, you know, ha have you talk with their clients that can tell you what, the, what we do for them and, and would be true for any other organization like ours. Another one would be a, a company that has a managed service but an automated platform. You don't want to be dependent on just the people uh, around the organization that can fix something. You know, and everybody has their bill or John, you know, J call John, he can solve it. Uh, we want it automated. We want to make sure that we have the right programs in place that can detect something, isolate something, and take corrective action immediately. And this is where the technology has evolved to, and we're at the top of it. So choosing a company that has these types of, of operations is what you want, and of course, staff. Uh, we have 15 engineers and technicians, and we have a very low turnover rate. We work hard at creating an environment that our team wants to be in. Uh, they're constantly trained, and they get incentives to, to get training. So they don't really have to look to move around uh, as much as maybe some other companies. But that's, that's what I would suggest, is really looking for a company that's been in business for quite a while and can give you the references uh, that you would need to confirm they're capable. Thanks. So, if there's other people in the room, and don't raise your hand, that clicked on that updated handbook, and you wanted to get a hold of HubTech and engage HubTech, how would you do that? Well, what I'd like to do is, uh, there's a number of members of my team in the room today, and if you would just stand up and introduce yourself real quick. I'm Dan Lovatier, uh, Director of Engineering for HubTech. I've been with the company for half of my life. <laughs> and <laughs> and <you> know, <laughs> yeah. um, but you know we we love technology. We're really passionate about it, and you know our guys read up on the latest threats, are always looking for new solutions and trying to identify you know new business needs uh, that our clients are experiencing, and you know constantly improving and growing with the industry. Thanks, Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Rufo. I'm a sales manager uh, at HubTech. I've been at HubTech for half of the summer. <laughs> can't, can't compete with Dan. Um, however, I, I have been in uh, uh, tech and consulting sales uh, for 23 years. And I uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you. Guys, if you can just hold up to your name and position, because we're going to run out of time. Rob? There you go. Rob Lewis, sales account manager. This is my partner, Paul. Paul Schiff, VP. <laughs> David DeLong, solutions architect. Thanks, David. Chris Taggett, Information Security Manager. Thanks, Chris. Zach, Account Sales Manager. Josh Andrews, Solutions Architect. Thanks. So the easiest way is they're right here. Whoop. 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 And Renee, Renee and I have Marketing Manager. Thank you, Renee. Sorry about that. Uh, don't, don't hesitate to talk to them. They'd be happy to help you. Uh, our number is 877-HUB-TECH. Uh, if you had an immediate issue that you needed help with, uh, you could call us. We'd help you as, as, as quickly as we can. Uh, service at hubtech.com, sales at hubtech.com. Thanks, Joe. And on behalf of Metro South Chamber of Commerce, please accept this pen as our. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Dan, for doing the interview. Um, our next speaker is Jeff Beeler from the United States Census Bureau. Um, he's the director of the Census Bureau's New York Regional Office. Office. He began his Census Bureau career in the Detroit office in 1997. He's worked for the Census Bureau headquarters, Dallas Regional Office, and as Deputy Regional Director. And in October 2010, he was selected as the director of the Re Detroit Regional Office. In January of 2013, Jeff became director of the New York Regional Office. He earned his bachelor's degree in statistics, mathematics, and actuarial science from Central Michigan University. Please welcome Regional Director of U.S. Census Bureau, Jeff Beeler, who will be interviewed by Dan Trout from Northeastern Savings Bank.
Okay. So anybody listens to, uh, I forget the name of the station, but 100.7, and they have the senseless survey. I thought I was interviewing you know, some of those comedians. Uh, so you're going to have to compete with that with this uh, 2020 uh, census. So what what is the census, Jeff? Yeah, absolutely. So we just celebrated Constitution Day yesterday, right? September 17th. Um, so the, the founding fathers, after they put in the U.S. Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, that three within three years after the first meeting ended, which of course 1787, uh, the first census would be conducted to determine uh, population uh, to ensure equal representation across the 13 states at that time, and then every 10 years thereafter. And we've been doing the first census 1790, uh, led by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, we, uh, in 1790, I believe the, they counted, was it 3.9 million people across 13 states? They needed 600 people to do it. To kind of contrast on what we did in 2010, we hired 650,000 people to work on the census, in which we counted over 308 million. Um, and we're expecting over 330 million in 2020. And, and why, it's really two things. And it's, it's the re representation. The U.S., um, the seats each state has in the U.S. House of Representatives is based upon the census data. So there'll be a redistricting event that will take place in 2022. I know in, in 2010, based upon the results, Massachusetts lost their congressional seat. They went from 10 to 9. Um, I don't believe there's any, the, the forecasters who are looking at how the, the population trends have been uh, flowing over the, this past decade, they don't believe there's going to be uh, seats lost, but if we don't count everyone, it, 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 there could be. The other piece of that is funding, and this is really, the, the, I guess, the piece that affects people the most. Um, over $675 billion of federal funding is disseminated every year based upon formulas that use census data. And there's a great, if you get an opportunity, Google counting for dollars. Uh, it was a study done by the George Washington Institute on Public Policy. And they looked at, they wanted to take that $675 billion uh, for the nation per year and break it down a little bit lower level. So they took it down to the state level. And in fiscal year 16, Massachusetts received almost $23 billion of federal funding based for the largest 55 federally funded programs based upon formulas using census data. So we're talking Medicaid, we're talking about food stamps, national school lunch program, WIC, um, highway planning and construction, Head Start, Section 8 housing. Just, you know, for the most vulnerable populations, these are programs that are, are truly they need. And that's why we have to ensure we get the most complete and accurate count. So there's been a lot of news surrounding the census and, and people going door to door. Is it safe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we're asking people to start the conversation about the census now. So it's, it's, it won't be just enough to fill out your form when you get it in 2020. We need you to have that conversation with your neighbor, with your coworkers, uh, at your church, at your favorite restaurant, to make sure people understand what the census is. And, and part of that conversation is the census is safe, it's easy, and it's important. And I talked a little bit already about the importance. So the safety. Every piece of data that the Census Bureau collects is protected under federal law. It's called Title 13. It was put in place in the 1950s. It basically states that data can, that you provide to the census can't be used against you. So in other words, we are not allowed to release any information that identifies an individual or a household. So when you see our data, it's at the state level, it's at the congressional district level, it's at a county or city level, it's at a census tract level. We can never release information that identifies a household or an individual. In addition, everyone who works on a census, whether it's you work for one of our short-term operations or like me, this is your third census, we're uh, taking oath of confidentiality for life. Meaning if I were to release information that would identify an individual or a household, I would be fined up to $250,000 for each instance. I would be in prison for up to five years for, for each instance. So we take it seriously. And the data we collect, we don't share it with other federal agencies. So local, state, federal law enforcement 
cannot access our data for any reason. Homeland Security, ICE, cannot access our data for any reason. The Patriot Act does not supersede Title 13. So it's important to note that the 2020 census is safe. Sounds like you need to hub tech to protect uh, some of your <laughs> sure. you have a card. <laughs> uh, so we talk about the, you know, the people that are going to be collecting the data. Um, so as individuals you know, in Brockton and surrounding towns, why is it important to participate? Absolutely. And, and I look back this morning at some of the data from Brockton and um, the city of Brockton itself, the census tracts that make up the city of Brockton. Uh, had self-response rates back in 2010 around 55, 56%. That means 56% of the households, when they got their form in the mail, they filled it out and mailed it back in. That means we had to go knock on doors to the other 40, 44%. And self-response is the highest quality of data we can ever get at the lowest possible cost. And so we talked about the census conversation. We, we, we just talked about safe, we hit important in the beginning, now let me talk about the, how, it, how easy it will be in 2010. And this is very new for us, and we talk about cybersecurity. This will be the first time ever you can fill out your census online. Formatted for smartphones, for tablets, of course if you have a desktop computer. Uh, so that's the first way you can fill out your 2020 census. Over the phone, we've always had toll-free telephone support. If you need a replacement questionnaire, you had a question, or you needed language materials, you could call us toll free. This will be the first time we'll actually accept information over the phone. So if a household wants to call their information over the phone, they can. We don't call you, so be wary of scams, but you can call us. This is huge for our elderly communities. They really look at this as a great opportunity because you know their kids are telling them, that, you know, don't go online, don't enter any information online. They're looking at this as a real positive change to, to, to call in over the phone. Every household that wants to fill it out on paper, because that's the way you've done it for the past four or five decades, every household will still have that opportunity. So we're not trying to replace filling it out on paper. We're just offering it as another opportunity. So those three ways, online, over the phone, and on paper, are what we call self-response. And the higher we can get that rate, if we can get that rate up to it, Plymouth County uh, as a whole was 80% in 2010, just just with that you know mail back uh, option. So if we can get places like Brockton, which are typically the places with those that get the highest undercount, who often often are those that are the most vulnerable when it comes to you know these programs and need this assistance, it's so important we get that count. So uh, one of the things that might be good would be to uh, coordinate with the chamber to see if we could. Uh, get the COAs, the Brockton COA in our surrounding towns to uh, have people call in. I take it that people won't be receiving a phone call. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. I, I will say that we conduct ongoing surveys throughout the decade. So you hear about the unemployment rate that comes out the first Friday of every month. We actually collect that data for the Bureau of Labor Statistics who releases the unemployment rate, consumer price index, um, housing starts. This is all data that our staff collects on behalf of other federal agencies. So there's always the possibility you, your address could be sampled for uh, by, by phone, but we send you a, a, something in the mail first to let you know that we're coming. But it's definitely on the 2020 uh, census form and part of the, the whole easiness um, uh, conversation. So it's a short form only census. I mean, we're, we say 10 questions, 10 minutes, but we're asking for your name your age and your date of birth, your race and ethnicity, whether uh, you're of Hispanic origin, uh, tenure, whether you own or rent your home, because it's a, an enumeration of both people and housing units. Uh, we ask your gender, and then your relationship, your relationship to the first person listed on the form, like son, daughter, mother, father, roommate. That's it, that's all we ask on the census. So, so we never ask for social security. We never ask for bank account information or checking account information, and we never ask for money. There will be scams in 2020. There always are. We just had one in, in Connecticut. Um, a certain national uh, party uh, did their state uh, uh, survey, and they decided to put the word census in bold at the top. And <coughs> we, we joke with, with 
with some of the, the elected officials and with the media, the Census Bureau never leads the news. And for a time over the summer, for like six weeks in a row, I mean, we're a bunch of geeks. We, we led the news because of the citizen, citizenship question, the debate, you know, ongoing with that. So people know that the census is around, and people will take advantage of using that word. It's not trademarked. We don't own it. Anyone can use the word census, uh, but that's something to keep an eye out for. Great. So you have 650,000 people that are going to be out here uh, going door to door. Uh, maybe it's a rhetorical question, but is the census hiring? <laughs> yes, please, please. Um, we are hiring. Here in Brockton, I can tell you the pay rate is $19 an hour. Um, these are short-term, the majority of positions that we hire are short-term, temporary positions. So you work on one of our field operations. And we'll, we'll have, we're already in the middle of our first field operation called Address Canvassing. that will end at the end of September, early October. Uh, but we have a number of operations we're conducting next year. So we're recruiting for those jobs. 6 to 12, maybe 6 to 10 to 12 weeks in length. Um, again, here in Brockton, $19 an hour, uh, uh, paid mileage reimbursement, paid training. Uh, and you can work this as a part-time job. And this economy is so different from 2010. In 2010, it's the first census I can ever remember where we stopped recruiting. You think, I mean, we were hiring in our offices, we were hiring clerical staff, the PhDs, because they, they couldn't find work. Now it's very different. So this is a great second job. People who have a 40 hour week job who just want to work in their community, maybe it's a civic pride thing, maybe it's making a little extra money for an upcoming vacation or to pay off holiday bills. This is a wonderful opportunity. And we have some information in the back and, and I should have pointed out Pedro. Pedro, if you wouldn't mind standing up and, and waving your hand. If you don't know Pedro, you need to get to know him. He is fantastic. He covers his area here and, and surrounding towns and communities. He's a partnership specialist with the Census Bureau. He can conduct meetings with you, hold informational sessions. We're doing uh, job fairs with community-based organizations throughout the area, making it as easy as possible for people to apply for for our jobs. And it's, it is extremely easy. There's a flyer on the, on the back table. 2020census.gov forward slash jobs. You apply online. Again, formatted for a smartphone. If you don't want to listen to the rest of my conversation, pull out your phone right now and apply for a job. It is super easy. 15 to 20 minutes. You apply once. Your application is good for the life cycle of the census. So it's, a, it's just a great opportunity, whether it's to earn that extra money or just, just you know, serve your community because the census is, is so important for the next, not just in 2020, but for the next 10 years, decisions are going to be made based upon this data, both with representation and with funding. And it's extremely important to get it right. Jeff, thanks very much for that uh, insight into the census. Uh, on behalf of the Metro South Chamber, please accept this one in as a token. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was great information, and thanks again, Dave, uh, Dan, for the interview. Um, now I'm uh, happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Michael Taylor. Um, Michael Taylor sets investment policy and structure structures out asset allocation strategies for approximately two billion dollars of client assets under management at Eastern Bank's Wealth Management. As the primary spokesman for the firm's investment services, Michael develops and disseminates economic and financial market view viewpoints. He's also responsible for selecting and overseeing providers of investment services. Prior to joining Eastern Bank Wealth Management in 2012, Michael charted a successful career at both institutional and boutique invest investment firms. He's also a member of the Board of the Economic Advisors of the Associated Industries of Massachusetts, the state's largest trade group. Michael holds an MBA with highest honors from Harvard Business School and a BA with honors from Princeton University. He's a chartered financial, angel, financial analyst. I'm thrilled to kick off our Good Morning Metro South season by welcoming Michael Taylor. Um, it's not going to fit, will it? No. Okay. 
That's fine. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon by now. Um, thank you all for coming out. I am going to, um, well, let's see, I've got 35 slides and, and 20 minutes, so you do the math, I'm going to go really fast. Um, and what I'll start off by saying is, if you're not familiar with Eastern Bank, um, we have $11 billion in bank assets throughout this area, certainly, throughout most of Eastern Massachusetts, a little bit of Rhode Island, a little bit of New Hampshire. Um, and we are very dedicated to our communities. We put back 10% of our profits into the communities through, um, through local charitable efforts and through taking care of getting involved with our communities. We donate something like 50,000 hours of employee time to our community nonprofits. Um, so we, we are here in the community for our communities. Um, I did pretty things. Um, this is what we do on the wealth management side. We work on financial planning. We take care of our clients' financial needs, our, our, their investment needs. We go through a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to say much about that, um, but I will just point to you. Uh, David, sorry, just stand up for a second. David is a wealth advisor with, with Eastern Management, so if at some point you want to talk about your wealth management needs, talk to David. Also, if you want any of these slides, they're, they're on paper right here on the center tables, um, but those, those are really small. If you want full page uh, pictures of the slides, we will email them to you. All you need to do is talk to David, talk to Lexi, talk to Chris, um, and we will uh, we'll get them out to you. So let's, let's get on with it. What I really want to talk about is the economy and where we're going with respect to markets. Um, and I'll start by just looking at back at last year. Last year was the first year in my lifetime when absolutely nothing worked. Every single asset class went down. Um, and it's just quite unusual. Usually they tend to offset each other. The weird thing is this year, every single asset class is working. Everything went up um, by different amounts, as you can see. But that leads us to an interesting question, which is where do we go from here? Is everything going to keep going up? Or are there sufficiently interesting, turbulent things happening in the economy right now that may suggest that, I don't know, let's just say gold may crash, or, or US large cap stocks may crash, or bonds may do something. Who knows? But let's talk about what's really going on there and, um, and what's happening. And I'll start with the stock market, because that's what most of us focus on, and it's where a lot of wealth is stored, and it's the riskiest of, of many of these investments. Um, so this is just a chart of the, uh, the S&P 500 index of large cap stocks over the last, uh, roughly speaking, 20 years. Uh, you can see the, the dot-com boom, you can see the housing boom, and, um, and you can see that that was the 2008 disaster. Um, lesson one, even in the midst of a disaster, don't give up hope because things tend to come back very nicely. Um, so here we are in the, at, 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 are we in the middle or are we at the end of, of a historic run? Uh, where do we go from here? That's going to be the question that, that occupies most of my time. Uh, and the answer is ultimately when you buy a stock price, when you buy a stock, what do you buy? <coughs> Excuse me. What do you buy when you buy a stock? You're buying the earnings and the cash flows of that company. So when you're buying a stock market index, like an S&P 500 index fund, you're buying those earnings of the index, or of corporate America, basically. Um, so where are earnings growth going? That's, that's what's going to drive the stock price. And here I'm just showing you what the projected earnings growth rate has been for the stock market going back again 20 years. You can see earnings go down in a recession, so it matters. Um, uh, whether the economy is going on, on a recessionary binge or not. Now, the last couple of years, we've got this interesting phenomenon here. And you can see that in um, 2017, earnings growth jumped by 10 percentage points almost overnight. And that was basically a residue of the tax cut. Um, you cut the tax rate, net earnings go straight up. And guess what? 12 months later, the exact opposite happens because now the tax rate stays the same from one year to the next, and so it came right back down. The much more concerning thing is why earnings growth has slowed even further after the effect of the tax cut has happened. Um, and that's what I'll explore a little bit in terms of what's going on and what we should expect. So the reason that we care about all this stuff is you hear a lot about inverted yield curve, um, and specifically 
Everybody tells you, well, every time there's an inverted yield curve, recession is coming. When recession comes, corporate earnings are going to go down. Therefore, the stock market's going to go down. Therefore, I'm going to the poorhouse. That, there are a few therefores in there that don't always hold water, in case you're wondering. Um, and here, let me just show you. This is the, the, the red line is a simple subtraction of the 10-year bond rate minus the two-year note rate, treasuries in both cases, government uh, debt. And you can see that every time that happens, every time longer term rates are lower than short term rates, we did go into a recession. It's happened three straight times, right? Um, and here we are, it dipped into a slight inversion about two weeks ago. It's still extremely close to zero. Two year and 10 year are almost exactly the same interest rate right now. So are we in fact going into a recession or not? Um, and the one thing I'll, I'll point out to you is this little blip right here in 1998. Uh, that's important. The yield curve did invert in 1998 and we didn't get a recession. Um, it inverted very briefly and very mildly, but it did happen. It, so, so which of these is what we're gonna see going forward? Is it um, a catastrophe like 2007 where it was inverted for over a year or is it going to be something like 1998 where it was over in a blink of an eye because the Fed took immediate action um, and proactive action? So let's go through what I call my bear market checklist. These are the things that we look at to help us figure out, are we looking at a recession? Are we looking at a bear market? Or are we basically going full steam ahead? And you can see there are some issues about the economy. There are some issues about the stock market, about interest rates or the, or the bond market. And I've added recently some global stuff because that's relevant too, as, as you'll see. Um, so let's start with the US economy and the simple measures that look at everything, things like confidence, things like um, uh, assessments of leading indicators. The US index of le leading indicators is actually a summary of 12 separate items that economists have pretty much concluded happen before the overall economy moves. And there are others like jobs which tend to happen after the overall economy has been moving. And those are lagging indicators. And you can see, looking at leading indicators, that they are positive. Not positive by a lot, 1%, 1.5% in a good month, but it's positive and there's no sign whatsoever that that's falling apart. Um, the overall economy, all of the indicators continue to remain positive. Now let's break it down a little bit. You guys are the people who came up with this chart. This is um, the Associated Industries of Massachusetts um, surveys a few hundred employers every month and asks them how they're feeling about the U.S., how they're feeling about the economy overall in, in Massachusetts. Are they hiring? Are they scared? Whatever it might be. And this is what they come up with. And you can see the green line, 50, it's an index, so 50 means neutral, neither, neither optimistic nor pessimistic. And you can see that employers in Massachusetts have been positively disposed, have been optimistic for the markets for a long time, and they continue to be a little bit less, um, as you can see, in recent months than they had been before. And you can attribute that mostly to uncertainty about trade. They don't know whether tariffs are going to change and therefore they have to change their supply chains or whether they're going to have to raise prices. So there is some concern, but basically, you got to conclude that people in Massachusetts like Massachusetts, and they like the U.S., but not quite as much. Uh, that's a good thing. Let's look at, at what businesses are actually spending on. This is durable goods. It's not just businesses. It's people also. These are things that people purchase that they expect to have for a long time. Cars, trucks, um, furniture, computers, um, in, uh, machinery in a plant, airplanes, all that kind of stuff. I actually exclude defense and exclude airplanes because those are, are big ticket items that sort of run on their own and, and distort the numbers. So let's just look at what's sort of the core economy. And there are three lines here. There are three lines here. The yellow line is the line that gets reported in the newspaper every month. It is the month to month change in durable goods orders. I think that is just noise and useless, so ignore it. The purple line is what's going on year to year. Now you're getting some sense of, of people are, are, are moving and there is some volatility to that. But we're talking about stuff that you buy for a long time and you hold for a long time. So look at the red line. 
which is a five-year moving average. And you can see that following the 2008 recession, it took a long time before people started buying again. And then there was a huge replacement cycle that came in because a lot of people had really out-of-date stuff that they couldn't afford to replace for a long time. And so that was a pretty robust replacement cycle that eventually petered out. Um, and here we are now beginning to show the next generation. This is a good thing. But is it going to stay? Notice the purple line. The one-year numbers are starting to look really kind of, I wouldn't say scary, but a little nerve, nervous making. So are businesses scaling back their purchases? Are businesses losing a little confidence and a little excitement? I'd say yes. And that does make me a little bit nervous um, about the future of the economy. And we know exactly why they're nervous. It really is all about global trade. These numbers are worse for manufacturing companies and they're somewhat better for services companies. Um, now let's shift to the consumer. Consumers are feeling pretty good. Uh, this is one of, of two major consumer sentiment numbers. And you can see the, the numbers are basically irrelevant. It's just an index, but the direction is important. And you can see that the level is high and the direction is good. These, the, the average American consumer feels really good about the economy. By the way, what happens when, it, when people feel good about the economy? They spend money. They buy houses. They, they buy cars. They go on vacations. They, they go out to restaurants. They invest in themselves and in their homes. And that's a good thing. So I love to see that number staying high. Um, here's one thing that they sort of have been doing. The housing, housing is critical to the economy because it drives so much else. So a dollar spent on a new house actually contributes three or four dollars to the overall economy because then you have to furnish the house, you maintain the house, you buy a bunch of stuff around the house, you get you hire somebody to take care of the lawn or whatever else it is. Um, and so when you look, this is overall housing starts in the US. It goes back about 10 years. Um, very steady improvement. The red stuff at the bottom, by the way, that's the Northeast, New England, and I think New York is in there as well. And that, that is flatlined. Um, so we have had virtually no growth in housing in this part of the country, and that has contributed to really steep price increases in this part of the country, which have priced out a lot of people. That's a problem. Um, and part, I mean, you can come up with any number of reasons. The most obvious is there's not a lot of land to build on here. Um, and infill isn't really as practical here as it is in other parts of the country. But nonetheless, the overall numbers for the country, well, they've been good, but they've kind of flatlined. And in the U.S., in, in Massachusetts and New England, they've definitely flatlined. Um, so year-on-year -year change, I'd like to see it better. Today's numbers, by the way, came out. They were fantastic, but... Last month's was so-so, two and three months ago were terrible. So overall, it's not a huge contributor the way it should be. On the other hand, the jobs market is phenomenal right now. Um, and, and this is a, a truly important thing. But remember, jobs lag the economy because the last thing a company wants to do is lay somebody off because then it's hard to get them back when times are good again. And at the bottom of a recession, the last thing you want to do is make a long-term commitment to somebody when you're not sure that it's really the bottom yet. So jobs tend to lag everything else. But I've got three lines here, and they tell a fascinating story. The brown line at the top here, that is the number of unemployed people in the United States. And you can see it goes from about 15 and a half million people at the bottom of the last recession in 2010 to a little under 6 million people now are unemployed. Uh, the yellow line is job openings, and you can see that's gone from a little over 2 million to a little over 7 million now. So at the bottom of the last recession, there were, roughly speaking, 7 or 8 job seekers for every job opening. Today, it's flipped completely. We now have a million and a half more job openings than we have unemployed people in the entire country. Uh, now, what does that mean? And by the way, the red is, is quits, people who voluntarily leave a job without retiring. The assumption is that they're going somewhere else. You don't voluntarily leave a job unless you've got a better job. So it's a measure of confidence of employees who say, hey, I'm, I'm in a good position here. I can get a new job pretty quickly. Um, and that's gone up, as you can see. So employees know that they're in a good position. Companies know that there are a shortage of good workers out there to fill the jobs that they need. And despite that, you would expect, frankly, in that situation, that companies would pay more 
to get good people. And that hasn't happened. Uh, so you can see the absolute hour, hourly earnings average has gone from 22 to 28 over 10 years. It's not a huge gain, but it, it's something. But the percent change running around 3, 3.5% is not huge. It's a little bit faster than inflation, which means that workers are making real wage gains faster than inflation. That's good for their spending. It's good for their confidence. But it's not runaway job pricing. It's not inflation. It's not really hurting the inflation rate, it's not really hurting the economy, or hurting corporate, corporate balance sheets to have people getting somewhat more money. It's not out of control. Why is that? Primarily because so many people are coming back into the workforce. So labor force participation is going up again. That's fabulous, because guess what? The best way to grow the economy is to grow the workforce. It's as simple as that. There's only two things you can do ultimately to grow an economy. You either grow the workforce or you grow the output per worker. Productivity is pretty tough. I'm going to speed it up here. Consumer prices, inflation, there's basically none. The orange line is volatile, that's producer prices. Um, but the, the um, consumer prices are stable. So the U.S. economy is doing fine. But let's now talk about the global economy very briefly. And you can see here that um, U.S. balance of trade with every other major country except the one on the right is doing basically fine. A little bit of imbalance here is not a bad thing, um, one way or the other. Um, that's fine. But the last one on the right is China. We have a huge trade, de trade deficit. That's not because of them being better than us or, or us being worse than them. It's because we in agreed voluntarily to a bunch of trade rules 20 years ago and 30 years ago, um, and especially with China's admission to the WTO in 1992, that are in simply not working today. They are unfair and they do need to be changed. Um, and that's what the trade negotiations are really all about. Um, it matters more to China than it does to us. We are a huge and resilient economy and we are also an economy that is basically pretty closed. Most of what we need, we can do ourselves, much more than any other country in the world. Um, and so you can see here, this is just percent of the economy. In red is China and white's us. Uh, that's related to trade. And across the board, whether it's imports or exports or anything else, trade matters more to China than it does to us. It matters to them and they will come to the table because of this chart. Um, as an aside, talk about Brexit, same dynamic. It matters more to one side than the other. I don't think Brexit matters too much to us, so I'll, I won't say much about it, except that Britain's in a really weak trading position right now because way more of Britain's economy is related to trade with Europe than Europe's economy is related to England. And Britain has a huge trade, de trade deficit that will have to be financed with higher tariffs if they don't come up with a deal. So Britain is not in a good place right now. Massachusetts doesn't make that much difference. Even the China stuff doesn't make that much difference here because our economy is very diversified. Education, services, um, transportation, Manufacturing, very little. All the big parts of our economy, education, healthcare, and so on, those are hard to export. Those are hard to offshore. So this economy here is much less cyclical and much less exposed to trade than most other parts of the country. Um, this is the, the end result. GDP growth is doing fine. Um, it was volatile, it smoothed out, and the US economy is tracking nicely. So what do you do with that? What's the investment outcome to that? Here I'm just showing you stocks versus bonds. It's the yield on a 10-year treasury in red versus the yield on the S&P 500 in, um, what is that, green. And for the most part, bonds should trade with higher yields than stocks, and they haven't. So stocks look really cheap compared to bonds because you're getting the same dividend or income level, except you're doing it with growth that comes from stocks that you're not going to get from bonds. So what's going on? Why do we have this disparity? Which, by the way, the last time that situation was true was all the way back in 1958. So uh, what you're looking at is a really unusual, once-in-a-lifetime kind of situation that's now persisted for a few years. So that same chart, by the way, I started with. The S&P 500 index in green, but now I've overlaid the earnings per share in red, and I've said that it's about a, call it 16 to 1 ratio of one to the other. That's the historical average price to earnings ratio. So when the green line is higher than the red line, people are optimistic and stock prices are high. That's the way to look at that. And you can see that right now, 
Stock prices are a little bit high. They did last December when people got scared about growth. But right now, investors are feeling good about stocks. They're feeling good about the economy, and they have every reason to feel good about the economy. Um, bond investors in credit markets, corporate bond investors, they're feeling good about the economy too. This is just a chart showing you the difference in interest rate between a corporate bond and a risk-free treasury bond. Um, and you can see the difference is pretty small now and has been for a few years, especially compared to the last two recessions when there were huge differences. So what that tells you is that corporate bond investors are feeling good about the economy too. They know that corporate bonds are going to be good paper. So it's only the treasury market that's freaking out and saying we're having a recession. Why? Because you got this inverted yield curve, which is only inverted for part of the curve, right? This just shows you from one month to 30 years, what's the interest rate on a treasury debt? Very simple chart. And it shows you that for a bit of it, you know, five-year paper is going to yield less than one-year paper, and everybody's freaking out about that. And I'll tell you, I think that's nuts, and here's why. The U.S., this green line is, I'm sorry, the U.S. is this line right at the top here. Still some inversion over the first few years, but not much. Um, but what do you notice about it? U.S. interest rates are way higher than anywhere else in the world. Now, Mr. Trump looks at this and says, you got to take that orange, that, that purple line and bring it way down with the rest of the world. I look at this and say, wait a second. The U.S. interest rates are higher because we have a, a, a fantastic economy that's doing really well, and the Fed doesn't want to put us into hyperdrive that eventually is going to crash. So I, I respect that. What's going on here is really everywhere else in the world is having serious problems with their economy. They can't grow their way out of their problems right now. Their demographics stink. Um, their monetary policy is a disaster. Their, they're trying to say, well, let's have negative interest rates and maybe people will spend more money. The problem isn't that there's no money and the problem isn't that they have, that, that the price of money is too high. The problem in Europe, especially, is that the banks aren't capable of lending because they're undercapitalized and because they have a ton of bad loans that came from the last recession. We got rid of all that years ago. Europe didn't. So why should we try to mimic what Europe's disasters are when we're doing fine? And as long as that's the case, as long as Europe sticks to its ultra-low interest rate policy, and you know, let's face it, Germany, Japan, and, and uh, the Eurozone, and Switzerland have below zero interest rates, that's Looney Tunes for the United States. It's not going to happen, but as long as that happens, a global investor is going to say, I want to buy a government bond, I'm buying the cheapest and best quality, which is United States debt. That's going to keep interest rates down, it's going to keep bond prices up, and that's why bond prices are doing, treasury prices are saying, gee, inverted yield curve, we must be a recession, has nothing to do with recession and everything to do with problems everywhere else. Here we're doing fine and we're not going into a recession. This just shows you Europe's disaster, U.S. economic growth is doing fine. So let me wrap up here. Here's the checklist again, except now I filled it in a bit uh, with some stoplight colors. Um, the economy at best, at, at worst, there's a few yellow lights here and there, but mostly green all the way. If you look at interest rates in the bond market, the Fed, I hope they don't cut too much. They'll cut today in about an hour, um, and hopefully they'll say more or less we're done, but they may allow for one more cut coming after that. Um, the yield curve, okay, that says recession, but I think we understand why it says recession, and I'm ignoring it, frankly. Um, credit quality is great. The bond, corporate bonds are not in trouble. The stock market, earnings growth has slowed, absolutely. Partly because the dollar is so strong, um, which is why people are coming here. Um, but it's not a disaster. And I'd say, again, slowdown is not, is not great, but I think we can work through it. The quality of earnings is great. The valuations are a little bit expensive, so I'll give it a yellow light. But overall, this isn't saying that there's a recession. In the global economy, there are problems everywhere else, so exporters, manufacturers especially here, are showing some concerns. Um, let me stop with this last chart. Um, what I'm showing you here is if you just take a 60-40 split between stocks and bonds, and you rebalance periodically with it, what's going to happen after each of the last six major bear markets? And the answer is after one year, which is the blue color, most of the time you're up, but not always. After three and five years especially, not only are you up every time, but you're up a lot. 
So as long as you stick to your discipline, you invest according to your total asset allocation, you will be fine no matter how bad things get, including the last one, which was you lost half your money in 2008, and guess what? You're still, you've actually more than tripled since then. Um, so stick to the discipline, you'll be fine. The economy is resilient, it's strong, um, and even if we go into a recession, we'll come out of it better than we went in. So let me stop there. Thank you all very much. Um, if you guys have time for questions, I certainly do. Thanks, Michael. And there are blue sheets on your table. I have a few of them gathered already, but um, while you're, if you could um, write them out and chamber staff will be around to collect those. So, Michael, the first question I, I saw for you is, um, the effect of the current UAW strike, um, and do you see that as affecting the economy at all in short term, long term, or what are your thoughts? Well, let, let's see how long the strike lasts. Um, if it's a short one, it'll have almost no impact. And even if it's a fairly long one, manufacturing isn't as important as it used to be in this country. There are only about seven or eight million manufacturers, uh, seven or eight percent of the U.S. population is employed in manufacturing right now. It's a tiny number. So yes, it matters, and it especially matters in the Western states where a lot of it is based. Um, unions, of course, are, are less than they used to be as a percent of total manufacturing. So unless it's a really long strike, I don't think it's going to have a major impact on the economy. Thanks. How about the impact of um, the China tariffs, and do you think they'll have an impact, and would you have done anything differently to address the imbalance in the trade with China? Well, the, 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 the China tariffs so far have had no impact, really. It's just a, a little bit of pricing here and there. Because a tariff is nothing but a tax, and when the tax goes up, it, you spend a little bit less, but it's not meaningful. If in December, the Trump administration goes through with its current plan to tax a half a trillion dollars of Chinese imports at 25%. Okay, I can do the arithmetic. It's $125 billion of tax money that comes in. Um, on a $17 trillion economy, it's about three quarters of a percent. That's three quarters of a percent that you and I are going to spend on taxes instead of on other stuff. So that would reduce the economic growth by a meaningful amount. It wouldn't send us into recession. It would not be a catastrophe, but it would definitely slow us down. Um, I don't think we're going to do that because I think the administration understands the negative impact uh, on that. But would I have done it differently? I'd have recognized that the issues here are not the price of goods going back and forth, but issues about intellectual property protection, about essentially, call it extortion of technology transfer, about access to the Chinese market. You can address those through other means that make more sense, such as how you allow Chinese companies to do business here, how they allow American companies to do business there. Tariffs are a pretty heavy club to, to wield, and they're not, they not delicate. Um, it, so they don't always do exactly what you want. Thanks. Um, this one says, does the traditional rule of um, 110 minus your age still work for diversifying portfolios in your eyes? Mm -hmm. I, I bet they could plan for that one. <laughs> the answer is no, it does not, um, emphatically so. And I'll take a, the, the idea behind the question is you take 100, you might 110, you might subtract your age, that's the percent you should have in stocks. So the, the older you get, the less you have in stocks. That much in concept, I'll accept. The older you get, the less risk you want to take, and so a little bit less in stocks. <coughs> but a couple of things to bear in mind. First, we are all living longer than we used to. Second, we are all living healthier than we used to. And third, our long-term expenses are going to be higher, whether it's for healthcare or for housing. I, you know, my mother is 84. She lives in an assisted living place. Her two biggest expenses are healthcare and, and housing, both of which are going up by three times the price of inflation. So, so there's no question that you need to save more money before you retire, and you need to invest it more assertively or aggressively than historically, because you're going to live longer and spend more money over a longer period of time. 
So 110 minus your age, no thank you. Um, you do need to be more invested in equities. And bear in mind that it is true that stocks for a one-year period will be more volatile than bonds. Absolutely true. Um, so when you need to know that you can pull out a certain amount of money in one year or two years or three years, then you shouldn't have too much in the stock market. But if you don't need money for 20 years um, or 30 years or whatever, there has never in American history been a period in which stock prices have gone down over a 20 year period. It has never happened, even in the depression, even in the great recession, it's never happened. And so, oh, and then there have been periods where bond prices have gone down for 20 years because you've had a 20 year increase in interest rates, for example, 1958 to 1980. Um, so over the longer term, stocks are actually less risky than bonds. Uh, so if you can put money away for a long time, you do it, and you do it in stocks, and you build your nest egg so that when it comes time to withdraw, you're going to be able to do so. Thanks. Um, we have another China question. Um, even though China is more dependent on um, trade than the United States, isn't the government less accountable um, to its citizens than the United States, and does that factor into the expected duration of the trade war? What a great question. And the answer is absolutely. Um, and, and you know, it's not just that, that it's not an elected democracy. It's that China has patience. Uh, their culture rewards long-term thinking much more than ours does. And they know they can wait out Mr. Trump. Whether he is reelected or not, whether they have to wait two years or six years, they can wait. And so that puts pressure on Mr. Trump to be sure that whatever deal he is able to negotiate actually is a good deal, and not just a deal for its own sake, which might be a really bad long-term deal. That's the mistake that Clinton made in 1992. He agreed, he gave away the store, which is why we're having this problem right now, because he wanted a deal. He wanted China in the WTO. That The terms that he agreed to were a long-term mistake, because China was patient. They, they, they had all the time in the world. China still has all the time in the world. They've got fortitude. They've got backbone, um, and they'll wait for a good deal for them. And I, I do worry that Trump may just take a deal because it's on the table, even if it's not a good one, just so he can go to his voters and say, "Reelect me, I got a deal." I'm hopeful that he understands this and he's going to hold out for a good deal. Good, thanks. And um, no more China questions after this one. Are the tariffs reducing the U.S. deficit? No, tariffs are tiny. Um, the, the, the level of tariffs we've seen right now are on the order of maybe 100 or something billion at most. And it's probably a lot less than that. The U.S. deficit year in and year out is close to a trillion dollars. It's 10 times as much. And when you have tariffs, what are you doing? You're reducing economic activity because I'm basically paying the tax in the form of a tariff, which means I'm spending less, which means that they earn less, uh, the government takes in less sales tax revenue, less income tax revenue. So, Tariffs, net of everything, basically don't help the U.S. Treasury at all. Thank you. And um, what do you think about companies that have moved offshore, and do you foresee them returning to the United States? In, in a word, no, they're not. Um, because whether there are tariffs or not, the reality is that it's, there are certain industries that it's much cheaper to operate offshore. If you are a very labor-intensive industry, especially low-skill labor-intensive industry, like apparel manufacturing or something like that, that those jobs are gone, and they're going to stay gone forever. Um, there are other places that will always be able to make, make that stuff cheaper than we can make it here. There are a few industries that are coming back here, by the way, and they are extremely energy-intensive because now the U.S. is the world's largest producer of crude oil. We are the largest producer of natural gas, I believe. Russia may be a little bit bigger. Um, and we have cheaper energy here. So data centers, for example, some steel companies, for example, are bringing stuff back into this country precisely because the energy costs are important to them and it's cheaper here. But for the most part, not really. Thank you. Um, and this last one, I don't see a question here, so I saved it to the end as, as maybe a thank you. Um, this is a very interesting presentation, was simple and great in explaining the economy and the stock market. So with that, I think that's a good ending, and, and thank you very much. Michael Taylor. <laughs>
first of all, for um, the winners of the drawing for the um, profile of your company in the action report, Jim Kelly, Power Management Company. And for the wine, uh, Ray Yaney, um, Mass Hire Greater Brompton Workforce Board. Congratulations. Um, and to close with the Chamber update, um, tomorrow, September 19th, the Chamber is hosting business after hours at Wood Palace Kitchens in Middleborough. That's from 5 to 8 p.m. That'll be celebrating their 40th anniversary. The 20th, 28th annual legislative and candidates reception will be held on Thursday, October 3rd from 5 to 7.30 p.m. at Donahue Hall at Stonehill College. That's always a, a great and well-attended event. The next Good Morning Metro South is Wednesday, October 23rd at the new Father Payton Center in Easton and will feature Don Wilson from 11.45 to 1.30. November 20th is the 106th annual meeting Luncheon and Business to Business Expo um, of the Chamber, and that will be held at the Team Challenge Multipurpose Auditorium. The keynote speaker at this year's event is author and philanthropist Bill Cummings. To reserve a, a seat at the luncheon or to reserve a tabletop display at the Expo, um, please see Lexi Reinerson, um, who is in the back. Um, so um, thank you all for coming, and to finish up our thank yous, today's ambassadors team, thank you very much, Rich Morgan Photography, today's interviewer, Dan Trout, this morning's sponsor, Hub Technical Services, Jeff Beeler from the U.S. Census Bureau, Michael Taylor, our keynote speaker, Thorning League Golf Club for providing the fabulous setting and meal, Brockton Community Access, the Enterprise. Thank you all, and thank you all for coming. Thanks.